Aaron Giles, welcome back to Conversations with Curtis. Thanks for having me back. To those of you who don't know, Aaron Giles is an emulation genius. And if you've ever played any of the LucasArts games on your Mac back in the 90s, then it's probably thanks to Aaron's emulations. If you want to hear more about Aaron's career and emulation background, you're more than welcome to watch my conversation with him on our channel. But that's not the reason why we're here. We've gathered here today to take a look at the new version of Aaron's amazing emulator, Dream. Looking forward to it. <laughs> It'll be fun to see it through someone else's eyes. So what can you tell us about the new version since the last time we talked back in January? Um, yeah, so a lot's changed um, a lot more than I expected. You know, when I did the first version, I thought, oh, I'd do a follow on version pretty quickly. But then it ended up being about nine months from the first release to the second release. And um, so the main things that came out of that one were I kind of rewrote all the front end and user interface to run on top of SDL, which means that we get Mac OS support, which was a highly requested feature. Um, and uh, it's kind of interesting for me because I never have touched a Mac since I left the Mac era back in the late 90s. So pretty much no OS X experience whatsoever on my part. So it was all new to me um, getting my hands back on, on, on a Mac after so many years. Um, the other major improvements for version two were expanded support. So um, I started with just the scum games and then the obvious question was, well, why can't we play the last Monkey Island game? And so I thought, well, the stepping stone to escape from Monkey Island would be Grim Fandango, which was also quite popular. And um, I was not directly involved with Grim Fandango, but that was sort of on the tail end of my uh, LucasArts career was when Grim Fandango was being worked on. And so I thought, um, that that would be an interesting target and probably an easier lift than going to Escape from Monkey Island. So I decided to start pursuing uh, more Windows support and doing that. But I also decided to explore in another direction because the first game I ever worked on was Dark Forces. And uh, I know there's great uh, support right now for things like uh, the Force Engine, which is doing great work to sort of recreate that sort of a, a scum VM version equivalent of uh, for, but for Dark Forces and, and eventually Outlaws. But uh, I kind of wanted to run it in the original emulation as well. So I said, well, how hard would it be? I have a good DOS emulator. I can already run a lot of DOS programs. How much more work would it be to get something like Dark Forces running? And eventually that led to some of the other uh, games of the era, like uh, Rebel Assault 1 and 2 and the X-Wing and TIE, original X-Wing and TIE Fighter uh, releases. So um, it kind of spiraled out of control after a while. It was really, I just kind of just had to pick a point and say, okay, I got enough new stuff, you know, uh, that I should probably call it. And on top of that, one other thing that happened along the way was that uh, in order to get the Windows games running, like Escape from Monkey Island, I knew I was going to need it to be faster. Uh, and I had always had a plan to rewrite the core emulation in assembly language. Uh, I, I'm, I'm one of the, my, my, my previous coworker used to always call me a bit twiddler. Uh, and so um, it's because I love working at the instruction level and working at that kind of thing. And I knew just from the structure of writing an emulator from so many times that I've done it before that like, if I ever had a need, the assembly language could open up a good chunk of performance that was locked trying to write it all in C. And so I decided that I'd give it a try. And uh, it ended up getting about a 50% uh, performance improvement just going straight to assembly. And then I did got to do it both for uh, x86 platforms and ARM platforms, which was also fun for me because um, the latter half of my career at Microsoft was spent getting Windows up and running on ARM64 platforms. And so I'm 32-bit and 64-bit platforms. And so... Uh, Writing directly to the metal on ARM was always kind of fun for me, and so I, I kind of enjoyed going back to that for a little bit. And version 2.0 is the first version with Windows game support, or did you have any Windows game support back in version 1? So version 1, I had um, Curse of Monkey Island support, which was the only Windows game. And uh, it turned out, looking back on it, that it was probably the easiest possible Windows game to do. It was super minimal in what it required. It didn't didn't have any DLLs that it shipped with. It just actually ran straight off the Windows system, everything that's built in the Windows system. And so, uh, and it only used a, a, a smattering of things. It's basically set up direct draw to, to, to get access to the screen and then just started sp splatting pixels onto it and, and didn't really uh, do anything complicated. And so it turned out that I was probably the easiest possible game to get started on a Windows emulation layer. As I found out later when I did Grim Fandango and later Escape from Monkey Island, there was a whole bunch of stuff I had to kind of shore up and, and implement that wasn't there when I had version 1.0. Was it because it was a scum game which ran on insane with the, for the cutscenes or? 
different it was be- reasons altogether. It was because that was the first, I believe that was the first shipped, either that or Outlaws was the first shipped Windows native game, Windows only native game. Most of the other games prior to that, if they had a Windows version, it was sort of like as a backup, but that DOS was sort of, it was developed on DOS. So Curse of Monkey Island was designed to go to Windows only, uh, as was Outlaws. Uh, which I worked on directly, which is why I kind of know a lot about that aspect of things. And I think at the time, my experience at the time with DirectX was that it was very early on. You know, we're talking DirectX 1, 2, and 3. I don't even know what there was DirectX 2, but there's a first release of DirectX, and DirectX 3 was sort of the first semi-stable one. But even then, we were pretty nervous at LucasArts embracing Windows. It was new to, new to us, and we weren't confident in all the drivers that everything was going to be stable. And certainly for Outlaws, we ended up... Uh, uh, shipping alternate versions of every aspect. So, for example, we we tried to run with DirectDraw, but we had an option you could swap in if that if your drivers weren't compatible, you could run you know drawing to GDI, which is like the normal Windows desktop drawing. Or we even at one point entertained the idea of like SciTech Display Doctor at the time had a, a Windows early Windows support for direct access to some of their hardware, and and we could swap in a a, a display driver that would work with that. And we had Glide support when we had the 3D. And so like we had all these options. And for sound, we had the same thing. We had direct sound, but you could also use the standard Windows Wave engine. And so it was very flexible. And I think Curse of Monkey Island, they decided to, because it wasn't a highly demanding performance-wise game compared to something like Outlaws, um, the idea was that um, they probably just kind of did the minimum support and just trusted that it worked because they weren't really pushing the edges of DirectX support very well. They just said, okay, we're going to do the simplest possible thing. We're not going to be tricky with it. We're just going to, you know, create an 8-bit 640 by 480 screen, which everybody supports. That was pretty much a guarantee out of the box. And we're just going to do the minimum. And I think that that was sort of the approach they took. And that's why it turned out to be easy for me to emulate in the end. So for Outlaws, with all of the alternative solutions you had, did you have to disable any of the graphical elements in order to make it work? Or it actually looked the same in each one of the solutions? So it looked the same in every one of the solutions. Because in Outlaws, it was still software rendered when we first did the release. And so um, we really much just rendered to a display buffer. The question was, how do you get the display buffer and show it to the user? And so you know, do you use direct draw and get to draw directly to the screen with page flipping, which gave the best experience? Or do you draw it to a bitmap in Windows and tell Windows to blit it to the screen, which can produce tearing and other kind of artifacts? Or do we talk to the SciTech Display Doctor and tell them to give us a pointer to the screen buffer where we can just put the pixels? And so the experience was was not really degraded until you get to 3D. When you get to 3D, you know, we eventually did add a, a native a 3D support. We had a Glide and we had Direct 3D, and I believe there were some differences there in terms of capabilities. Glide was the 3DFX native uh, renderer, in case you didn't remember. <laughs> OK, let's dream. <laughs> you can see my crazy orange background. Yeah, I love <laughs> your crazy orange background. I was always Did you do it with I, fractal design? I was always into Mandelbrot sets as a kid, and so I found some cool uh, fractal Mandelbrot set online and colored it orange, which is sort of my color of choice and just decided to throw that up as a background. It doesn't compress very well, though, so it's not great for video. <laughs> OK, so this is your website, AaronGiles.com. And from that website, let me go to the main page. Let me go to the home page. Um, from here, I see that the first project is Dream. You can also check out uh, Aaron's other projects over here, but today we're focusing on Dream. And from here, they'll be able to download the latest version. Mm-hmm. Do you also want to talk about the beta releases in case they'll be in the future? So yeah, in the future, I'm sure there'll be another beta at some point. I'm already working on new stuff. So at the bottom, you can click the beta release link, and that'll take you to the page where there's you know, versions you can try that may not be stable and, and tested. And at the moment, we don't have any. So we have yeah. only version 2.0 for testing. Yes. Let's install it. Now, if you're on a Mac, it'll look slightly different. Yeah, so you'll get this, unfortunately. Uh, Windows tries to protect you a little aggressively. So you just need to click the more info there. Uh, as far as I understand, this is all uh, done uh, through uh, reputation. So as far as I understand it, if enough people are running the software or bypass this and run it anyway, that that might give the servers back at Microsoft a clue that, like, you know, it, it's OK because people aren't complaining or identifying it as a virus. So. Won't it help if you have a certificate or? I do have a certificate on it. 
But apparently I don't have the super expensive certificate on it, which you need to, if you're a corporation, you have to get the expensive certificate, which kind of... Maybe you should set up a GoFundMe page for that. I should probably do that, I guess. It's kind of unfortunate. (laughs) Okay, I'll install Dream in the default folder, and I'll run it. All right. Okay. So here's what you get when you start up the first time. It's... uh, It's just sort of telling you how to get the installation process started. Unlike previous versions, the previous version of Dream would actually um, have different ways of installing the games, and the games you had installed lived wherever the games were originally. Uh, In the new version, um, you install games, and they get copied to a folder that Dream uh, owns and manages so that it can make sure that uh, things don't move around out from under it, unless you get tricky about things. So every copy of the game is duplicated, basically. Yeah, I mean, if you keep it around on your hard drive. I, for the smaller games, it's not a big deal. But if you have you know CD images or whatever of some of the bigger games, you know, it'll add up a bit. Um, if you click the, I don't know if you have any... Uh, uh, good old have. games versions installed or anything on your system, but uh, if you should click search for games, it will actually scan to see. Uh, Dream knows a little bit about like where Steam and Good Old Games puts their versions. So if you buy certain games, unfortunately not all of them will work, but if you buy certain games through Good Old Games or Steam and have them installed, Dream can pick them up by clicking the search for games, and it'll try to automatically detect them and, and incorporate them into its list. So it's basically you looking through your entire hard drive, or just no. In the... it, it's targeted. It knows sort of where it looks like on Windows. It'll look through your program files, uh, look at, uh, program files. It actually knows specifically where Steam and Good Old Games puts their stuff. Um, so I can see it's already found something. So I found that you had Escape from Monkey Island from. Mm-hmm. Uh, Let's skip this game. Yeah. I'll oh, come install on. it. So, no. <laughs> Don't worry. I'll install Escape from Monkey Island. I'm, I'm joking, of course. Um, um, so the other thing it can... found. Wait, it found only this game for right. some reason. Do you have other okay. games? Some games it won't find because, um, for whatever reason, they did not include the full set of files in some of the games. So a lot of the games shipped with uh, ScumVM as the mechanism to run it, and ScumVM doesn't require the original executable file. And they're kind of hit and miss about whether they included the executable file with it. And if they did include it, I can use it, and I know where to find it. And if they didn't include it, then uh, unfortunately, I, I just can't run it. Usually, it will try to detect uh, whether it finds any cases where it found all the files except the executable and should tell you that you were missing the executable. But in this case, it doesn't look like it found anything. Well, as far as I know, uh, the versions that come with ScumVM don't usually um, come with a executable file, but games that are bundled with DOSBox do include it because they need yeah. it for DOSBox. Yeah. Okay, let's start with The Secret of Monkey Island, the EGA version. Okay. Classic. Indeed. So I see that it found an exact match. Um, can you tell me what happens in case it's not an exact match? Or if, how do you um, recognize a version of the game that's actually the game, but not something that you've prepared for? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so basically, uh, Dream has a list of. For every game, it has a list of all the files that it needs to run the game. Um, and it also has a, a CRC for every file that it needs to run the game. And so to, to find a game, what you do is you drag either a disk image or a folder or a zip file onto, onto Dream, and it will scan that for something it recognizes. Um, so for every game, there's something called uh, anchor files, which are sort of like, here's where the bulk of the game is going to reside. So if it finds like monkey.000, which is a common name of a file or, or you know, dot .lec or, or there's certain file extensions or whatever it recognizes says, okay, well, that's probably a game. And then I'll look in that directory and all the subdirectories from within there to find the rest of the files. And so it'll scan, it'll look for files with the right name. If it finds a bunch of files that have the right name, but they don't all match the checksums or the CRCs that I have in my database, I'll say, well, I found what looks to be a game. It has all the right files, but I don't recognize it as officially supported. So it'll give you a slightly different message here rather than says sending found an exact match. It'll say found a, a partial match. It'll give you the option to still install it. It'll copy all the files for you. Um, but you'll see a warning when you try to run it that it says that uh, it's not a, not a fully tested and verified to, to work. Now, most of the time, I suspect that stuff will work. Um, I can't 
I've tried hard to uh, get access to as many different versions of different languages, different releases. It's kind of an explosion of versions. I mean, honestly, if you look at things like Monkey Island, I probably have identified over 30 different versions when you count all the languages and editions and bug fix releases and, and stuff. And so um, they're all in the database, And but you may have one I don't know about. Um, I try to not include support directly for uh, like fan translations or um, hacked versions, I prefer I prefer to only support officially supported versions. So that means if you have a hacked version or a fan translation, that's an example of something where you may see the message that says it's not an exact match and you just say, well, I'll, I'll install it anyway and just live with the fact that it's not officially supported because I don't think I'll apply to support those long term. So for example, this version of The Secret of McKellen is the eight, eight floppy disk version. As you can mm -hmm. see, I have the images themselves and not the files. So you can see that Dream supports the images. And let's install it. Now, which options do I have in order to uh, change the graphics and the sound settings? Right. So as soon as you install a game, it'll install whatever games it finds, and then it'll take you to this screen. And this screen shows you um, the, the name of the game, which version it is, and gives you options to configure it. So you can click on Configure Game to, to configure your options. And in this case, every game is different. So the version the Monkey Island is one of the most configurable games. So you'll see lots of options here. But other games, you may see none, or you may see a small subset. So here's your graphics options. And you can select uh, which type of graphics adapter you want to run it with. Um, Monkey Island supported the Hercules, which was kind of a fun thing uh, and CGA. The EGA version supported Hercules. Yeah, it's true, the EGA. Once they once they made the 256 color VGA version, they dropped support for uh, anything except that. So you have to run the EGA version to get all these great juicy options. So, so I'll choose Hercules because it's the best graphic <laughs> the graphics best graphics. adapter. <laughs> and then sound. Um, it also has you know, Game Blaster, which probably a lot of people haven't heard, and, and the, the three channel PC Junior sound. And even supports the PC speaker, though it's not a lot of sound effects. It's mostly just the the original tune you can hear in I'll PC speaker. I'll choose the PC speaker. <laughs> you really because want the old not, ma not many people with Hercules back in the day had a sound blaster. That's true. <laughs> you can create some unholy combinations for sure. OK. Anything else, or can we launch the game? You can launch it for now. I think that's probably good to get into it. So the EGA version has copy protection. So uh, you got to get your monkey. You got your monkey wheel handy. I don't have my monkey wheel ha handy because I had the CD-ROM <laughs> version, so there was no copy protection. Yes. Well, fortunately, Dream will help you out here. It, it assumes that you probably lost your monkey. You lost your not your monkey. You lost your uh, your monkey your monkey wheel, and will actually identify the uh, graphics on the screen to to give you a hint about what you should type in for your answer. So, so the the message at the bottom is what Dream tells you is the answer to this copy protection Correct. question. And this is particularly important on the uh, on the Hercules version because those graphics are really kind of hard to make out. <laughs> I spent a lot of time cross referencing them. That's a badass theme. I know. It, it sounds good even with one voice. <laughs> Kudos to uh, Michael Land and the folks for uh, making something that sounds good even on crummy hardware. <laughs> That's enough of that, I agree. <laughs> we'll save it for Loom. Yes. So one of the new, so I did support Hercules in the first version of Dream uh, for Monkey Island and, and the earlier games, though it didn't support uh, the copy protection as well. So that's sort of a new addition. But uh, one thing you can do is, and I think that the previous version had the Her Hercules adapter with black and white image, and not no, it had green. green but... And then I got complaints that they said, "Well, what if I had an amber monitor or a black and white monitor? How? how what well, you assumed it was green?" And I thought, "Well." You're right. I did kind of make that assumption. So you can fix that now. So if you want to bring up the menu, you can. Uh... Oh, bring up the menu. So once you're running, how do you bring up the menus? That's a good question. There are in-game menus for within Dream. Uh, previously, in the last version, there was a menu bar at the top of the screen you could get access to, um, and uh, you could also use F12 to toggle it. Uh, in the new version, there's a whole GUI layer that you can throw on top of it, and so you can either press F12 or uh, use Alt plus U 
to bring up the menus and you get your in-game this menu This is F12 there. and this is Alt plus C. Both bring up the same yeah. menu. So okay. then here you get the same kind of options you had before for um, you know which kind of display adapter or sound adapter you want to use. If you choose a different display, for example, you want to switch to VGA, uh, it's going to restart the game because the game uh, those are command line parameters to the game, so you can't really start change that dynamically. Um, you mm -hmm. can one new thing that's new in this version is the the volume controls. You can um, that's new. Uh, you can actually <laughs> it's actually so, playing the sound. Right. So because the volume controls, uh, you kind of want to hear how loud you've changed the volume to. It actually unpauses the game out from behind you so you can hear the sound. So don't put yourself in a dangerous situation before changing the volume controls. Uh, but once you do, you can use the sliders there to change the change the sound up and down. Or you can change your Hercules monitor color. So that's something I added just you know, with the Amber. Ah, green is the color. Green, green to me is the color for Hercules. Green is the OG. Is the OG color for? I think a lot of us like the green because um, yeah, Lucas starts to debug a lot of the early games which were running full screen. Is you'd the only way you could get a second monitor under DOS was to plug a Hercules card in because that mapped at at a different address than the VGA graphics. And so uh, when you when you um, had them both plugged in, you had a VGA card and a Hercules card. You could address them both independently, and you plugged a second monitor into your Hercules card, and you could print debugging displays. So the original the original Windex uh, scum debugging tools and everything knew how to talk to a Hercules display. Man, our imagination was amazing back in the 90s. We had to look <laughs> at this image and see the twilight sky and the waves in the sea and Guybrush on top of it. Well, the funny thing, too, is like the, the EGA graphics were, you know, I've heard uh, Mark Ferrari talk a bunch of times about how the dithering was a big deal for them uh, yep. to add in Monkey Island. But the Hercules, on top of the dithering that Mark did, dithers the colors to the Hercules display. So you have dithering on top of dithering to produce this kind of sunset effect. So I don't know if that quite pulls it off effectively, but... It's, uh, it's 50 shades of green. <laughs> uh, the thing I find hard is it's sometimes hard to actually see what's going on uh, when you're in the Hercules version of the, of the game. So you don't get the scum bar theme, unfortunately. They, apparently they decided that didn't sound good enough in... Uh, yep. In the early days, but um, the the cursor is blinking faster in the Hercules version. Yeah, I noticed that. Probably, it probably it's probably intentional in order to make you see where the cursor is, given that everything is green and don't actually yeah. understand what's going on. Yeah, the M Monkey Island in Hercules is a little bit different. So the other games that sur supported Hercules included um, oh, we do get an interstitial theme here. Oh wow, they removed the entire background for the Hercules version. You can't <laughs> see the map, you can't see anything. I'm sure it wasn't important. Okay! Anything else you want to show me in this version of Monkey Island? Or can I install Monkey Island VGA? Yeah, let's, let's, let's get back to a slightly more modern, modern edition. Okay, how can I get back to the launcher? So you can use Alt Alt plus X, or you can bring up the menus and, you, and go to the menu to, to exit. But Alt plus X so will Alt. give you an option to exit. OK. And that returns you back to the, to the game. Um, and uh, if you want to install Monkey 2, you can drag it here. When you first started, there was a, you were on a different screen that showed, you know, said, you know, to add games, drag and drop games here. But once you've added your first game, at any time, you can pretty much drag and drop a new game, and it'll let you. Uh, let you install it so you don't have to you can leave it here and drag and drop the disk images for monkey island 2 and it should just go okay i'm going to install monkey island 1 the oh, vga okay. version okay which is uh, the four the four three and a half inch floppy disks version oh we have to use the installer so yes this is a good thing to test because um some games came with their own installer which needed to decompress the games. And rather than making Dream understand how all that compression worked and everything like that, what it does is it says, oh, I recognize this as an installer. I will just run the installer within Dream itself since I, I have a, I'm a DOS emulator. And so uh, whenever you get to something like this, it'll show you the installer screens. And all you have to do is install it to your C drive anywhere. And once it's done with the installer, once you exit the installer, 
uh, Dream will search the C drive for, for game files and, and find the ones that you installed. And I saw that Dream is giving you instructions on which drive to choose. And yeah, I gave you a little hint at the beginning there to hopefully reinforce that. But almost all the time, you can just hit Enter until it installs. And then okay. you're done, and it found it. Now I can see that we have two variations, and I can basically skip between the two. Yep. And if I can uh, go back to the game screen, then I can choose the game and then choose which variant of that game I want to right. play. So in the, in the previous version of Dream, I listed all the games and their variants in one big list. And so this time, I've sort of broken it up. So you have an icon for each game. And then when you get to this screen, it'll let you pick between the different versions of the games. And each version may have its own set of options. So once again, you have uh, copy protection here, but you get it at least in VGA color. So. It's a little easier to find on your monkey wheel, but uh, it'll still help you out. So which audio did you configure for this one? I guess you left it at the default. This is ad lib. That's probably the ad lib by default. Cool beans. <laughs> so in the EGA version, uh, in the VGA version, um, as you can see, it's the VGA version, not the CD VGA version, because right. I still have the the twelve verbs. Uh huh. Over here. And of I course, you don't have to theme. see the audio. Right. Now take a look at the background. What we missed in the oh, Hercules yeah. version. <laughs> missed this entire thing. The yeah, map. Yeah, the blues didn't translate. They mostly went to black in the Hercules. One of okay. the incentives I had for uh, writing Dream was to make use of my uh, my. Uh, FM emulator, so for the Yamaha FM chips, and so the Sound Blaster, the FM sound that you get for these games is playing through the emulator that I wrote for that, which I originally wrote for MAME, um, but then uh, decided that it was more broadly useful, and so I pulled that out into a separate library called YMFM, um, which several other programs are using now, and uh, use it in Dream as well. And in the game's configuration, it uh, recognizes it as Sound Blaster? Yeah, Sound Blaster is what you'll see. And it's actually a Sound Blaster 16. I don't differentiate between them. I decided, uh, you know, there's a certain, uh, you know, working, having worked for many years on MAME, it's tempting to go for every esoteric combination and say, well, you can configure for Sound Blaster Pro or Sound Blaster, you know, original or all this other thing. But I think I decided to put the, put a limit on it and say that, uh, honestly, you know, if you want, the Sound Blaster 16 did feature an updated, upgraded uh, FM chip so you get slightly better sound, um, and a few games did take advantage of that. Um, but if you want like to the uh, FM sounds that are close to the original Sound Blaster, then you can just play it as ad lib because it's the same the same chip as ad lib. Okay. Anything else you want to show me in this version of um, Mankala, or can we switch to? No, let's try Ooh. something new. So Alt X. Alt X again. Think of the game. Back to games. Let's see what else. We've got in store. So now I'm going to install the version of Loom I played as a kid, which is the <laughs> Hebrew version. Loom so EJ Hebrew. Didn't even know it existed until you pointed it out to me. Well, apparently I talked to Eric Wilmander. Apparently LucasArts didn't uh, know of this version either. I think they allowed the localization of the packaging, uh -huh. but didn't know that they actually localized the game. And I found that out by the fact that I tried to uh, to create a version with a copy protection for Loom, for uh -huh. Dream, and I couldn't find one. The ones online are the ones with a cracked version, and my original uh, floppy disks no longer work. Mm. So I tried many types of combinations, and then I found out that if you use the ex uh, executable file from the English version, with the Hebrew version, it recreates the Hebrew version. So I was interested in why that worked. So I talked to Eric Wilmander, 
and he said that they probably hacked the English version and changed the the LFL files or or any of the text files and changed those to have Hebrew in them, but they didn't actually change the executable file. So that's why it worked. You know, the, the, the truth is that there's an actually inter interesting story behind this, which is that I supported the Hebrew version of Loom in 1.0, but I supported the cracked version because that was what I was able to get my hands on. And then it was pointed out to me that all the copy protection screens were translated, which indicated to everybody involved that it was probably originally shipped with the copy protection screens intact. Yeah. And then we noticed that the executable that came with the cracked version was identical to the English executable um, from a later version. Uh, sorry, it was identical to an English executable that was on cracked versions of English ex uh, English versions. Uh, sorry, mm -hmm. cracked English executables. Uh, and so um, we said, well, by analogy, it must mean that the uncracked English executable must work with the with the original files. And so we tried using the uncracked English version that we think was the one that probably shipped, and that worked. And so. Um, uh, that's the one I ultimately deemed was probably the correct one, though I still have yet to get my hands on like images from original floppies to confirm it. So if anybody out there does still have working Hebrew floppies of Loom, um, especially the first one, I'd love to confirm what executable is actually on there so I can uh, be sure. Of, so of, so of, we of both reached the same conclusion on different paths without knowing that we are looking for the same thing. Yep. <laughs> So and that surprised me because you actually write it. You found an exact match, but this this version is a hybrid of the files from the Hebrew version with the executable from the English version. So I tried to right. figure out why why it's an exact match. <laughs> it's an exact but match through educated guessing, uh, and it wasn't just me. I, there's a few uh, folks I I've met online through Dream who are super into decompiling Loom and studying it, and people who work on some of the uh, limited run games editions and stuff like that who I've talked to about some of these issues. And uh, so some of this is sort of more than just my idea of what I think is the right answer. I think it's more of a consensus between a few experts uh, to, to kind of agree on, like, we think this is what the right answer is. It'd be great to get confirmation, but for now we're gonna go with our gut. I'm still I'm still looking for, for an actual copy of the original files. The reason why I was trying to recreate the, un, uh, the original version of the Hebrew uh, edition is because limited run games and released the Loom Collector's Edition uh, a few months ago. So I talked to them when they announced it, and I asked them to add the Hebrew version to the Collector's Edition. Now the pre-order, the pre-orders have have ended a while ago, but now the the actual Collector's Edition is in production. So while they're working on it, I tried to get them to add the Hebrew version. So they asked for the original version because they can't ship it with a cracked version. Ah. So that's why I was trying to recreate it and trying to get my uh, floppy disks to work. But in the end, this this was the solution that uh, that was deemed the most appropriate. <laughs> Let's install the game. All right. Any interesting configurations here? Nope, doesn't have uh, Hercules support, unfortunately. But uh, let's play it on some C. Let's play it on EGA. I was gonna say let's let's go to EGA. CGA is not particularly pleasant. Yep. And in EGA, we'll be able to see Mark Ferrari's amazing work. <laughs> okay, so this is the version I remember. <laughs> and the funny thing is that Hebrew is actually written right to left. Uh, but they didn't because they're using the English Scum engine. They they kind of just sort all the text reverse uh, in the uh, in the thing. So Scum has no idea that it's drawing things that are actually read right to left. It just knows that it's drawing strings and that these are the characters it should draw. Uh, and it just it just worked out. So whoever whoever did the port did a pretty clever job to just kind of make sure that that all worked out. It was a 16 year old kid that I'm trying to interview. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's great. I can't wait to hear that. So, so anyway, copy protection another piece of trivia, too. another piece of trivia that Eric Wilmander told me that in order to get the Hebrew version to work in the the hack they did to to add Hebrew text to the game is the fact that they 
had to have the same amount of characters or less than the original text in English. Oh, yeah. In order to make it work. <laughs> okay, so we have the copy protection and we have Dream telling us right here what the actual combination is. Let's get cracking. As you can see, because this is in text, this is a, a graphic asset, they didn't translate the logo. Yeah, that's true. Did they translate it on the packaging? I'll show you the packaging in a moment. <laughs> So now is a great time to check the volume settings. Yes. You can also use the arrow keys to up and down, move up and down too. That's easier. So did you have to add any special support for the Hebrew text or did it just work out of the box? It just worked out of the box as long as all the files were there. Because it's the English executable, um, the level that Dream works at is mostly at the executable level. So. Okay, let me uh, let me show the packaging. Okay, so as you can see, this is the Hebrew packaging. Oh, nice. And if you know how the original packaging looks like, then you probably know that it says Loom at the top over here. And instead of changing the logo, they just created a border around the image of the hands in order to cover the English text. And then they wrote <laughs> the, the text in Hebrew. And it's got entirely different look in the back. They even chose an image that I talked to Mark Ferrari about how they achieved it because it looked like it had a gradient color. You see this image? It looked Come like it middle. had a gradient gradient color mm -hmm. in the background. And I tried to ask him how they achieved the gradient look. So he told me that they probably changed the settings on the CRT screen in order to make it blurry. And then the <laughs> dithering made it look like they there was a gradient over there. Nice. So did you play the Hebrew version all the way through as a kid? Yeah, this is the first adventure game that I finished as a kid. The first adventure game I played was Maniac Mansion. The second one was Zack McCracken. The third one was Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I didn't finish any of them. <laughs> until much later in life and this was the first version that actually that this is the first game that I actually f played from beginning to end without any help and finished apart from the fact that it's a short short game it's also an easy game and it was in Hebrew so <laughs> that was great and by the way I know that Loom didn't sell that well in the US and that's why they didn't have any sequels to it but in Israel, it was a hit. It like it's like every kid had a copy of Loom over here. I have to imagine it was pretty exciting to have something that was localized for for Hebrew. Probably not a yeah, very common. Yeah, this situation. was the first game, the first international game that was actually translated to Hebrew. Hmm. There were games that were made over here, but there was never a game, especially from a company like Lucasfilm Games, that was translated to Hebrew. So this was a big deal over here. Yeah. Okay. I always thought it was neat <clears throat> to see uh, the different language versions when I was working at LucasArts and doing Dream. I've got access to seeing some of the more esoteric versions. Uh, we've, th through the help of some of the folks, uh, we've uncovered, you know, uh, uh, a Taiwan release of Curse of Monkey Island and Korean versions of that. And uh, there's a Korean dig version out there. And various other things, which I kind of knew that, you know, as I was the later Scum games, as when I was working at LucasArts, I knew that there was work on getting, um, uh, we call them the CJ, CJK versions, the Chinese, Japanese, and Korean uh, language versions uh, supported, and that involved larger character sets and other things in the uh, engine, which you know, stretched the engine a bit. But I know that as of the dig, they certainly had, it, and I don't know whatever actually got released. And so I knew that the support was there. And that there was talk about doing some of these, you know, uh, languages, but I had no idea what was what was uh, released there. Certainly, I don't think any of the games ever supported 
right to left explicitly as as an option. So I, I think he, the Hebrew loom was a sort of a one-off. I never really heard much uh, discussion about doing a, a native Hebrew version from the group uh, internally at, my, at LucasArts. Yeah, after the conversation I had with you, I had a conversation with Brad Taylor, and I asked him if he did anything in the Scum engine to support right to left text. And he said that he didn't do anything. So that explains why they had to write everything backwards in order <laughs> to make it work. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's switch to a different game. Hey, while you're on the next screen, I'll, why don't we look at the more options and I can just talk those through real quick. So for okay. every game, you can click on more options. That gives you the options to uninstall the game, so it'll remove it and delete the files. You can also click to show install folder, which will just open up uh, an explorer or the finder if you're on a Mac, uh, the folder containing the game files if you want to see uh, what they look like or where they're at. Um, and uh, show game data folder will show uh, if the games write any files out to your disk. That they're not mixed in with the files that are installed. They're, they're stored in a separate location. There's a virtual file system kind of in between the game and its original location. So those will get put in a different spot, and you can show where that is. And apparently you had installed this uh, when, when I was in beta, so you, it was in a different location before. So uh, that most people won't see the show old beta game data folder unless you were a beta tester of 2.0. <laughs> Which apparently I was. So good. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay, let's switch to Zach McCracken, FM Towns. All right. Now, this so, version came with a few demos, so I see that it recognizes three items over here. Yeah, so uh, the, the FM Towns version, so for those who don't know the FM Towns very well, it's a Japanese-only uh, uh, PC, PC clone-ish kind of thing. It wasn't really exactly a PC clone. It was actually a fairly unique piece of hardware in that it had a lot of the components of a PC, but it also had a built-in FM chip that was similar to like the Sound Blaster, but actually not quite as good. Uh, it's more like what's in a Sega Genesis uh, style FM chip. And it had a digital speech chip, also like the one in the Genesis, or like uh, one in the Sega games, like this, like Sega System 16 games. And it had a fancy video hardware that uh, allowed you to overlay uh, two layers of graphics and had sprites and all kinds of other fancy things on there. And so, um, but the thing was, it still ran on a, a Intel processor, like, and it had a DOS support. So you could actually boot DOS on it. Uh, and so games that were shipped for them, if they're originally written for DOS, it was a pretty easy port, some, somewhat easy, to get them to run on the FM Towns by just kind of taking, using the fact that you can basically run DOS on the FM Towns and taking your DOS game and kind of getting it to run on there. Uh, I wouldn't take advantage of the new features. So LucasArts in the early days uh, had some deals with, I think it was Fujitsu who released the FM Towns. They had some deal to release some of their games for the FM Towns, and uh, Zach McCracken was the first one. And it was the one that got the most notable upgrade because uh, there's actually three versions of Zack McCracken out there. There's the original low resolution version, which had the same graphics as was on like the Commodore 64 and that, which, uh, which is pretty pretty low resolution. And then they did a, a, a higher resolution version, which is probably the most common one on the PC for Zack McCracken. Um, but that was still only 16 colors. But the Fujitsu Town supported uh, 256 color graphics. And so they actually did a full 256 color version uh so they upgraded all the graphics to 256 so it's like a vga it's like kind of like the difference between the monkey island ega to monkey island vga upgrade you get the full vga graphics um but they never released the 256 color version back for dos uh even though um i can tell you a secret that eric womander had a version that on dos that actually would run the from the fm towns uh data files and so you could actually play it but uh, that never formally shipped but i've seen it run on dos um I have a conversation with Eric Wilmander in two weeks, and I plan yeah. to have a six-hour conversation with him you, about everything. You probably everything. could. <laughs> but uh, the other thing about the FM Towns is that they had an FM chip to play music, but um, they didn't. LucasArts didn't use that for their sound. In fact, what they did was they recorded Redbook audio, uh, and so because the FM Towns was a CD-based system, and Zach McCracken was a tiny, tiny little game. They uh, had the full, pretty much a full CD worth of sound that they could put on there. And so they pretty much just recorded nice quality versions of all the tracks. And so you'll get to hear versions of the, of the soundtrack that you wouldn't normally get to hear and ambient sounds too. Okay, so we have three items over here. We're going to skip the demos. We have Zach McCracken. We're going to install this one. 
So there's two versions on here. So which is also interesting because the FM Towns was only a Japanese console. You might find it surprising that we shipped that LucasArts shipped uh, both English and Japanese versions of the game on all their CDs, but they did. And so, uh, you know, it's not even that it was a that there was that it only existed as a Japanese version. It actually existed as both English and Japanese, but for some reason never made it back to the U.S. For English-speaking Japanese residents. <laughs> Now, why don't we have any configuration for this game? So the FM Towns was not like a PC. It was like it had similar hardware to a PC, but it was not expandable like a PC. So it's not like you put a Sound Blaster in an FM Towns or something like that. You kind of just worked with what you had there. And so um, because there's no video options, you just run with the FM Towns video, and there's no sound options, you just run with the FM Towns sound and the CD audio. Uh, there's no options there, so that's just dimmed out there, so you can't. Can't configure so it. basically, it was like a PlayStation console. Yeah, I mean, have one configuration. Be, that's it. Yeah, it was meant to be much simpler. Um, they'd released many versions of the FM Towns, and some of the later ones might have been expandable. Um, so I may be wrong about that, but I don't. LucasArts didn't take advantage of any of it, so I didn't provide any options to to do it. Okay, let's launch the game. I still have the, the volume from the previous. Oh, yeah, I remembered what your volume was. Ooh. You'll notice there's separate volume controls for the CD audio as well. This was because the CD audio on uh, machines of this era had independent volume control. Um, and so you're actually allowed to uh, configure it independently from the sound effects. This theme song was badass even on PC speaker. It is. I actually think this song, this is one of the best uh, theme songs that they did in terms of just how well it translated across all the different platforms and uh, and sound card support. Zach is too detailed. I'm used to the EGA version of Zach. <laughs> There's also an interesting bit of trivia. Uh, in that the graphics so on the CD the support has both English and, and kanji versions. Uh, for the Japanese release, they altered the graphics of Zack. His eyes are bigger, in a more anime-style eyes, than uh, in the English release. And so it, it's a pretty subtle detail, but if you run them side by side, you can definitely tell that the graphics for Zack uh, look different uh, between the two versions. I don't know that they did much other uh, tweaks to the graphics, but that's one tweak that they did do. You know, now, nowadays you have remasters coming out every every decade or so for certain games, but back then you'd have remasters coming out every six months. You'd have the EGA version, and then you have the VGA version, and then you have the FM Towns version, and all this in the span of two years. Yeah, yeah, it makes, it's pretty crazy from a point of view of my you know from my perspective. I'm trying to catalog them all so that I recognize them when you add them to Dream, and it's it's kind, some of them are kind of insane. All the different versions that they have. Insane. I see what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. One technical detail about the FM Towns version is that um, all the text is drawn on one layer of graphics, and the cursor is as well. And then the background graphics are drawn on a second layer. They're combined in the video hardware. And this isn't that noticeable when you're playing the English version. But the Japanese version, the top layer of graphics is actually twice the resolution of the graphics underneath. And that allowed the kanji characters, the Japanese characters, to be fi more finely detailed. Uh, and mm -hmm. so for, for English characters, they're just drawn, you know, four pixels in a square for every pixel that, that they draw on the Japanese side. But on the Japanese side, the kanji font's a, a full resolution font. And I had to go, uh, had a big journey because it's built, the font is built into the ROM of the FM Towns. And I don't have license to use the ROM. So I had to go find a public domain kanji font that had the same characteristics in terms of size and pixels of that font. And it was public domain that I could use and, and convert that to incorporate into Dream so that when they went to look up the kanji characters in uh, in the ROMs, that I could give them something that was reasonable, even if it's, I don't know how close it is to the original font of the FM Towns, but uh, better to stay away from uh, borrowing that stuff directly. Don't want to get in trouble. Oh, now I can turn up the volume. Oh, and you you, you probably also see the smooth scrolling. Yeah, so they didn't just use the CD audio for background tracks. They used it for uh, for uh, for sound music. They also used it for ambient background tracks. So. Mm -hmm. And that crunchy, staticky sound, which is on the 
on the PC version is like a kind of a, a sweepy sine wave kind of sound. Mm -hmm. um, I spent a lot of time investigating what was wrong with that, and it turns out that that's an original issue. Like they're providing a sound to the chip that is, you know, like one sample long, and it ends up being just a click. So either they tried to delete the sound or something like that, but uh, it's uh, that's, uh, that's the PC speaker sound of, of the PC speaker sound of this machine freaked me out as a kid. Dun -dun, yeah, yeah. Dun -dun. Yeah, 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 yeah. But here you can hear the ambient sound from the CD audio. It's just like you know, sound in the of the city. And then... so they they probably use the same technology to create the Loom CD-ROM version because there they also used Redbook audio. Yeah, it's pretty similar in a lot of ways. But over there, they also <laughs> had the dialogues as part of the CD audio, which is why the CD-ROM version is the worst version of Loom, because the, all of the dialogue is truncated so that it will fit on one CD, which is about 70 minutes, and they're using only 45 minutes of dialogue. Yeah. The... Um... One other advantage of the FM Towns is that it has smooth scrolling, which uh, you didn't see in the PC version. You only saw in the, uh, I think maybe the Amiga versions might have had smooth scrolling. But as you walk along here, you'll notice it smooths. It scrolls a lot smoother than the PC version, which tends to scroll kind of chunky. So this was this is how it looked on FM Towns, or it's a feature of Dream? No, no, it's uh, FM Towns. The hardware it's actually using the hardware uh, scroll registers to do that. So because it had more console-like graphics, it had the ability to do that. And the reason why it's easy to do is because, again, I said it was on two layers where the text, the, the, the verbs and the inventory and the cursor are all on a separate layer. And so they can change just change a pointer to where the background position is on the background layer without affecting where the text and the cursor show up because that's on the front layer. And so uh, because they had that separation, that allowed them to do the smooth scrolling. I always take the scrolling for granted, but I remember how many games didn't have scrolling back then. I remember that I was impressed with Commander Keen that it had smooth scrolling back in the day. Yeah, and I still was... remember that even even in King's Quest Seven, you'd have the option to cancel to disable the scrolling basically, mm -hmm. and in case it was too CPU heavy. Okay, let's switch to a different game. So it's interesting. They did also do a, a FM Towns version of Loom, but it does not have the audio, the, the, the voices, like the uh, CD-ROM version. So even though it's a yeah. CD-ROM version, it doesn't have the voices. <laughs> no, I think it's not the CD-ROM version because it has the original dialogue from the EGA version. Yeah. So it's the EGA version with the VGA graphics. So some consider it the, the best version of Loom, but <laughs> I still prefer the original EGA one. Give the other interesting thing about Loom on the FM Towns is that it has two versions of the theme. The, the kanji version will play a different Redbook audio track of the theme than the English version will, because apparently tastes differed somehow, uh, and they decided that the uh, that it would be better to have the Japanese would prefer a uh, different version of the theme for whatever reason, and I have no idea why that was. So that was a fascinating tidbit that I learned. Of the same part of Swan Lake, or they changed Swan Lake to something no, else? No, it's the same. Well. It's the same piece. It's just orchestrated differently. I see. Okay. So, some sometime when you're bored, install the both versions of Loom and listen to them both. I'll probably do it after this conversation. <laughs> That's the first thing I'll do. Okay. Now, now we're gonna switch to to one of the most important games that you've recently added, which is Escape from Monkey Island. And the reason why it's important is because the, I played it only once in my life. It's still considered um, the worst Monkey Island game, but and I haven't played it since the early 2000s. And after I started playing it on Dream, in the beta version of Dream, I've noticed that it's not a bad game. It's a bad Monkey Island game, but it's not a bad game. I find a lot of it to be pretty decent, but the controls are really hard to get past. And it, it always kind of frustrated me that like I felt like it should have been possible to incorporate some kind of point and click movement into the game. But going 100% to tank controls is just really, really frustrating to navigate around because I find that a lot of the frustration I have is just trying to get somewhere or to move quickly. 
Um, one thing that took me a while to find is that you can use the O key to step out of your current location, and that speeds things up quite a bit navigating around. And until I found that, I was trying to, you know, every time I needed to leave the city, I had to run my character over to the edge of the city, and uh, it kind of was pretty painful. And now with the remastered version of Grim Fandango, they've added mouse support to Grim Fandango. They? Because unlike unlike the other remasters that Double Fine did, Full Throttle and Day of the Tentacle, in which they took all of the graphics and re redrew everything in higher resolution, in this case, they didn't have the original 3D models and they didn't have the 3D models of the pre-rendered backgrounds. So they used the pre-rendered backgrounds as is. The game is not widescreen, so they added two bars on the sides mm -hmm. in order to accommodate the fact that you're playing on a widescreen monitor and you're playing a 4x3 game. And the 3D models of Manny and all of the characters were recreated. So you have high-resolution characters on pre-rendered backgrounds from 1998 with mouse support. <laughs> Sounds interesting. From the personal log of Guybrush Threepwood. Sometimes when it's quiet, I can still hear the monkeys. It's hard to believe that it's only been a few years since I first washed up on the beaches of Melee Island, armed with nothing more than a goofy name and an overpowering urge to become a swashbuckling pirate. I want to be a pirate. Who could have suspected that such a humble pursuit would lead me to cross swords with the evil ghost pirate LeChuck, the slimiest slug ever to plunder the seven seas? <laughs> An interesting fact about Escape from Monkey Island is that I believe it was the first LucasArts game to use a, a third-party uh, video engine for playing their cutscenes. So prior to that, they'd used Insane, uh, which was Vince Lee's engine that he developed for Rebel Assault, which you know we went mm -hmm. on to use for um, the later Scum games, and then also for Grim Fandango used it as well. Outlaws used it for their video playback. Um, but around the time of Jedi Knight and uh, Escape from Monkey Island, they uh, switched to using Smacker, uh, which I believe is the current thing. And that, that was actually pretty much much higher demand uh, on performance uh, to do that. So that was one of the one of the reasons why I really wanted to get my uh, x86 emulator uh, faster was because in order to support Escape from Monkey Island, as soon as I got it working here, it was really stuttering through the videos. And so I had to do a lot of work to make sure that it... It, uh, it worked. It also took advantage of, that, of, of of MMX, which was the first instance I've seen of anybody using MMX, and so uh, using that for some of the video stuff as well. So I had to add that support for that to my emulator as well. So they used this um, video player because they had to play the FMV scenes in Jedi Knight, so they were looking for something more robust than Insane? I think they just realized that Insane had kind of hit its limits about, you know, the quality versus compression trade-off. I think they wanted higher quality than they could get, and I think Insane was very tuned for, you know, first-generation video, full-motion video on first-generation CDs at, you know, 150K per second, um, you know, and, and the original things. And so its, it's codecs were all tuned there, and rather than developing new codecs to do better quality at higher bit rates, which they could do now, they said, well, it makes sense to just license something and uh, use more industry standard type tools. And so I think that was the motivation there. OK. Let me just skip the, let's turn down the volume. OK, so the tank controls are working. And you can basically use the, the page up and page down to mm -hmm. look at different things and use the U button. Man, the controls are horrible. Then you can pick up with B, right? B. You have to select oh, the look at the pile of hot yeah. coals and then yeah. P. Yeah. And now I can use it with uh, with a loaded cannon. Amazing game. 
So this was the first of the games that I supported that required 3D. So Grim Fandango was still written at a time when you had a software 3D engine as a backup, and uh, you supported 3D hardware if it was available. But uh, Escape from Monkey Island actually had a hard requirement of 3D. So I wasn't quite sure I was going to be able to support it in Dream uh, until I sat down and really tried to dive in and see if I could create direct 3D, basically, in software uh, emulation for, for Dream. So... And which yeah. other games that you've added to Dream use the 3D? Right now, it's just Grim support. Fandango. We'll use it optionally. And I, right, because now, now, now that I have it working, I, I tell it to use it standard. But apart from that, nobody else uh, actually uses the 3D engine. But in the future, more games may take advantage of that. I have ideas for games that I might want to support that would take advantage of that. So. Is Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine in the list you're talking about? <laughs> I have not actually looked at how heavy duty the requirements are on that game. I'd have to see and how, how complex the 3D scenes are. I, I think I'll start with Jedi Knight first. Is probably the, Actually, Outlaws... So the first versions of Outlaws didn't use 3D, so they're all software rendered. Um, but uh, later there was an add-on where you could get a direct 3D renderer. Uh, and add that to the system. And uh, so in theory, that, that should work. And Jedi Knight came out of the box with direct 3D support. So I think Jedi Knight's probably a more, more likely early candidate. And then we'll see. W- do you know when Infernal Machine was released? 1999. Oh, okay. So it's kind of the same era as Escape from Monkey Island. It's, it's a year before uh, Escape from Monkey Island, which was released in 2000. Uh-huh. And uh, in... in by the way, in the Infernal Machine, there's an Easter egg in which you can change Indy into Guybrush. <laughs> and it, it actually looks better than the one that ended up being in Escape from Monk Island. Huh. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because you can comment on the quality of the, the models that they used here and, and stuff like that. But I have to say, I'm pretty surprised. You know, I added some t- statistics to see how many polygons they're drawing. And in some of the scenes, they're drawing thousands and thousands of polygons, you know, for like two or three characters. And uh, I honestly think it looks, I think it looks pretty good, honestly, for yeah, the time. Uh, the, the The problem is that again, I didn't play it for several years, and I bought it on GoodOldGames.com, mm-hmm. and that version is running it with the Windows compatibility settings. So it's widescreen, and it looks bad, and you can't stream it on on Twitch and such because. The resolution creates problems with OBS, so ah. it's a mess. So the fact that you've added support for Escape from Monkey Island for Dream made it possible for me to play the game and actually enjoy it for the <laughs> first time in decades. <clears throat> and an interesting limitation of the 3D engine is the fact that the you couldn't add more than three characters in addition to Guybrush in every scene. So you have two characters over here. Mm-hmm. And in the next scene, you'll have two characters, two to three characters, and that was the limitation of the 3D engine. And they had to accommodate that by changing the plot so that it will explain why the island is so empty. <laughs> because some some real estate model bought, bought the entire island, but basically, the true story is they couldn't handle more than characters yeah well, i think they were just so, aiming for the video hardware at the time which probably couldn't really handle much more than that in terms of number of so even here you can see it's guy brush and three characters but if you go to the other part you'll see two characters and you don't see the other three so there's no angle in which you'll see all of the patrons it's a little bit of the guy on the side there i saw a brief yeah he's the, the third side. one so yeah he's the third one yeah i have a stress test a save game which is my stress test scene which is them on the docks and it's got his three Guybrush and his three uh, co co uh, shipmates, his shipmates, and uh, that's that's my stress test scene in order to see like how many polygons it'll throw at that. And it's like in the upper single digit thousands. So you know, honestly, this is all software rendered. So that's one of the <clears throat> things that's kind of interesting so about. Even in that scene, you have a bird's eye view of the island, and you see Guybrush and the three teammates, and no one else say uh, in that scene. Okay, moving on. <laughs> now we're going to play Dark Forces. 
All right. When you started working on Dark Forces, did you know that they're working on the Force engine? Well, I mean, that, oh, you mean, yeah, I knew about it. And my interest, again, is pretty similar to my interest with running the Scum games, which is that, you know, running, having a good way to run the originals without having to go through the complexity of getting it up and running in DOSBox or whatever. Um, plus, I have an affinity for Dark Forces since it's the first game I worked on when I was at LucasArts. So, of course, I was working on the Mac version, but... Uh, and of course, you're trying to recreate the original experience of playing these games. So yes. you also have the original save games. And after my conversation with you, I had a conversation with the team, uh, the project team leader for Scum VM, and he told me that they started working on recreating the save game, the save screens for each one of the Scum games because of your work on Dream. Yeah, I thought that was kind of kind of interesting. I mean, you know, it's. For, for for an engine like that, it's just a lot of creating those, doing that work is a lot of, this is a labor of love is what I would say. It's a lot of tedious work is what I was going to say, but I'd say it's more of a labor of love, which is that if you care enough to want to do that, you can recreate it, but it, it just takes uh, some extra extra effort um, to do it. And they just hadn't, hadn't done it yet. But I think with Dream coming out and them seeing like, well, here's a reason why somebody might use a different uh, engine rather than Scum VM, so maybe we we uh, we had the support in, in Scum VM as well. I'm totally legit that they did that. I'm kind of glad that that uh, was spurred on by what we did. Now, when you when you worked on this version for the Mac, yeah, back in the '90s, um. Was it harder to make that compatible with a Mac than it was to make this compatible with <laughs> modern machines? Well, I mean, I'd already done most of the work for, you know, Dark Forces is just a, game, a DOS game with a DOS extender. Um, so it really wasn't much different from uh, running the later scum games like The Dig or Full Throttle. Um, it did require me to rejigger a few things in terms of like supporting uh, mouse in a different way. With the scum games, I wanted the mouse to transition in and out of the window smoothly. So it was sort of tracking the absolute position of the mouse. Whereas when you're playing a game with it, like Dark Forces, it's actually capturing the mouse and detecting how far you're moving it left or right. So you can kind of keep moving. If you want to spin around with mouse look, you can keep moving to the left over and over again. And uh, if you're tracking absolute coordinates with the mouse, you can't really do that because uh, you'll hit the edge of the screen and then the mouse won't move any further. So you have to kind of capture the mouse to make that work. So because it's recreating the original experience, then you can look up and down only using the page up and page down buttons, right? Yes. Yeah, they didn't really have mouse look back then. This was sort of pre-mouse look. I've seen there's yep. patches available that for for Dark Forces that, that hack well, it Well, they in. have it in the Force engine. Oh, I'm sure they do. Uh, it, they'd be foolish not to. I mean, even my kid knows how, maybe my, my kid knows mouse, mouse look and WASD as, as the way to play games. And the, as soon as I got this up and running, I turned on mouse support and I'm like, how, can, how is this not working the way I expected? And I, I am hardly a game player. I really don't, I really don't play, play games very actively. And so, uh, you know, I learned WASD and mouse look from Outlaws. We put that into Outlaws, and so um, that's my I experience. I still remember the first game I played with the keyboard and the mouse was Abuse. Do you know the game from 1996? Oh, yeah, I remember that. So this was mind-blowing. <laughs> you, had, you, had you had to work with both parts of the brain in order to activate <laughs> both hands using yes. two different controllers. Well, at least with Dark Forces, you can look up and down, even if it's awkward and and you can jump which is the thing that always still frustrates me when i go back and play doom it's like there's a little ledge and you just can't go up on it because it's it's you know you can't jump and Doom. yeah but <laughs> but the thing is that in dark forces um even though you can look up and down using the the keyboard they made it possible for you to shoot up even if you're not looking up so for example i have a stormtrooper over here Mm -hmm. And I can shoot it just by shooting in its general direction. Yeah. Because it will be too cumbersome for me to look up and look down. Probably people weren't used to it. Yeah. Well, it was kind of new at the time. 
Okay. I mean, Dark Forces is kind of an interesting, you know, example of the era because it was had a lot of the capabilities of Doom, but it added the up and down look and it added the jump and it added 3D objects within the scene. So like your ship and that kind of thing were in there. And then, you know, when we did Outlaws, we we took that and then built uh, sloped surfaces, which wasn't in Dark Forces. That was the thing. Major engine addition for Outlaws was sloped surfaces. Now, another game that you added support for is the ultimate talkie version of Monkey Island 1 and 2. And yes. given that you're a purist, how <laughs> did you add support for these hacky versions of Monkey Island? Yeah, so I have to admit, I, I broke this just just because of uh, because of awesome, honestly. Um, you know, the, the one... I, I, I'm not going to wait into the discussion of the special editions of Monkey Island about how, how worthwhile they are or not. Uh, I know some people have their opinions. Um, on that and not all of them are positive but um, one thing I will not fault is the voice acting is pretty good across the board in my opinion and, mm-hmm. and at least they're consistent having uh, Dominic for uh, Guybrush through all the whole series which is great and so um, I uh, I found that there were people who had created these ultimate talkie versions where you can basically run a script that'll take your uh, special edition files, extract all the voice files for them and then hack the scripts of Monkey Island to run on top of a later version of Scum to run like the Indiana Jones engine, which did support talkies. And then uh, through this unholy combination of everything, you basically get a talkie version of but running the original graphics and the original uh, scripts from Monkey Island. And so... Uh, and the original IMU system. The original IMU system, yeah. Because, so, for example, in, in Monkey Island 1, you couldn't play the when you switch to the classic version in the special edition then you wouldn't have the voiceover you'd have the classic version mm-hmm. as is but with monkey island 2 they listened to feedback and they added the possibility to listen to to play the classic version with the voiceover so that's why the ultimate talkie edition wasn't that well maintained like the first one i think uh-huh. the, the the ultimate talkie edition is still in version Point zero, point one, or point two, while the the talkie edition for the first one is one or one and a half. I know. Yeah. The key with this, if you if you follow the instructions, and I don't know if you'll, uh, I don't know if you'll share the web location of the website where it is, but it, there's instructions for how to build the ultimate talkie version from your you know versions of uh, the special editions, and there's several ways to do it. Um, so if you do it your, yourself, make sure you do the DOS instructions and not the scum vm instructions because the scum vm instructions produce uh, compressed uh, audio files which stream doesn't support since stream is more of a pure dos emulation it only supports the version um, that is pure to dos that would run on a real dos machine so just follow the instructions to create those sets of files which creates a monster.sou file which is sort of the standard indie indie fate of atlantis talk talk now that file. does the um, support for monkey island one ultimate talkie edition and can it run the the CD audio? No, I don't think it does. I think it's only, I think it only produces files that are from the VGA version, the non CD. Yeah, no, when you VGA. create the ultimate edition, then you have two folders. You can have the CD audio, and you can have the the MIDI files, and you can choose which one. No, actually, you don't. You have the CD audio from the original version from the nineties. And you have the CD audio of the special edition, and you can choose which to play. So oh. you can basically support both of them, or you play the the MIDI files from the original version. Or you that's don't interesting. Know. I didn't know that that was an option, so that's something I'd have to look into. It's from from my experiments, I've only ever played with the MIDI MIDI version. Because let's see if I have the version over here. I'll show you how it looks. I suspect the other version wouldn't work on Dream as is, or it would give, tell you I didn't recognize the files. So this is how the folder looks. You have, once you create the, the Ultimate Talkie Edition, you have CD Music FLAC yeah. files of the version from the 90s, the CD version from the 90s, and from the Special Edition. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't have support for that. I don't have FLAC support in, in Dream, and I, I didn't recognize that that was an option. I, so I overlooked that. But I'm a MIDI purist. Let's get to stick with the MIDI stuff anyway. It's fine. It's fine. Don't worry about that. Let's skip this. Can I hear the MIDI sound? 
I can't I hear anything. You got the volume pretty low in that MIDI. Also. What happened? Did your screen sharing lock up? No. Nope. Apparently, changing the volume. Restart game. Let's try it again. You can just use Alt V to go right to the volume control. Deep in the Caribbean. Oh, remembered it, apparently. Scab Island. It said the text. Control T. So I bust into the church and say, Now you're in for it, you bilious bag of barnacle bait. And then LeChuck cries, Guybrush, have mercy. I can't take it anymore. I think I know how he must have felt. Yeah. Let me just turn down the phone. Those guys would know a good story even if they paid 50 bucks for it. So did so, you have to do something special for the iMuse edition, or it just no, works pretty out much just box. worked. It's using the same uh, scum engine as Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, so. Once once one of the engines works, it's pretty easy to get other games on the same engine to work. So because they just hacked this script to work with the uh, same engine, it just kind of ended up working out that way. You know, speedrunners who play this game, they play the Amiga version, yeah, and on mute in order for the iMuse to stop working because the iMuse Hello. takes a couple of seconds. Once you enter a room, it waits a couple of seconds in order to sync with. Uh -huh the the music from the room you're entering to so so you're saying if i want speed runners to use dream i should make sure that uh i have a version of disabling all sounds so that they will disable the iMuse. first of all while while we're on the subject <laughs> i during this time i've talked to the guys at speed uh, speedrun.com mm -hmm. in order to add dream as a viable platform for speed running for well, several you. games Glad to hear and, that. And if you want people to actually use it more than they use ScumVM, then you can uh, start adding timers built into the emulator itself. You can uh -huh. actually run the, the timer once you're in the system. Hmm. <clears throat> I'll have to look into that. It never occurred to me. <clears throat> I am. Uh... One of the things that's interesting is um, if you they did Monkey Island 2 and Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis were the last two games that they released for the FM Towns, going back to that. Um, and the interesting thing about those games is they stopped using CD audio for them, and instead they play MIDI, kind of like uh, we get here. But the, the FM chip on the FM Towns is not as capable as the Sound Blaster. And so what you get are some pretty terrible translations of i mean you, there's recognizable as the themes but they sound very quiet and lackadaisical and like they, they have all, lost all their edge to them so especially the theme for monkey island 2 i encourage you if you want another fun thing to do sometime is blow up the fm towns version of monkey island 2 and play the opening theme and just shake your head at how how much it changes the mood of the whole thing because of, of the lack of support will do <laughs> I have a lot of things to do after this conversation. I know, I kept you busy. Okay, now we're going to play one of my favorite Star Wars games, Rebel Assault 2. Oh, yeah. Which is also something new you added in version 2.0. Right. Yeah, this and uh, Escape from Monkey Island were the, and Grim Fandango all have are my two CD games, which presented some challenges because I wanted you to be able to install from the original game discs, but it's kind of tricky to install from original C multiple original CDs, uh, and I still have to figure that out, a, a better solution. Right now you have to kind of copy all the files to, to your folders and, and drag them onto the, onto the Dream program in order for them to work. So hopefully I can make that well, better in the next version. 
if you're using a CD drive and don't have enough space on your hard drive, then you're probably using a retro PC. <laughs> so install it on your Windows 95 and play it over there. There you go. Now, no, this game works well, but some options in the launcher will cause an unexpected exit. What's that? Yeah, about? so there you see where warnings will show up. So most of the games should see just everything was working fine, but occasionally you'll see situations like that. Okay. I'll use the, the mouse. Probably a good idea. So yeah, around this era, LucasArts started using launchers for for all its games, and this is uh, this is one of the first games and to have a launcher built in. Any special reason for that? I think with the advent of Windows, it was just becoming more user friendly to like not jump right into the game full screen, but rather to like give you a chance to like configure the game and set it up using the the front end Windows GUI before you leapt into the game full screen um but uh, it also because gave... of the uh, because of the automatic run for windows 95 maybe yeah yeah that, that was part of it it also gave you know vince vince lee was a notorious knob twiddler so he uh in rebel assault 2 you'll see that uh in the launcher it gives you access to level configure your, your duration which brings up this terrible huge spreadsheet of like every configuration value you can tweak it on a level by level basis for like, you know, 10 or 12 knobs for each level about the difficulty and behaviors and stuff like that. And so if you're really... And the IRQ for the Sound Blaster. Yeah, well, you can do that, but I only support one, so you better not change it or else you won't get sound. <laughs> I'm used, I think I, as a kid, I used IRQ 7 or 5. So yeah. let's help you support one of them. <laughs> I just recently found out that even though they advertised this game as the first live action f Star Wars film since Return of the Jedi, it's not true. Oh, yeah? Bill Tiller, yeah, Bill Tiller, Bill Tiller recorded a few FMV scenes for Rebel Assault 1 and just drew over them in the cutscenes. <laughs> so oh, that's funny. So they're basically rotoscoped, huh? Kind of, yeah. <clears throat> so are you any good at this? Yeah. The 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 second Rebel Assault is actually a good game, in my opinion. Yeah, the first, well, the almost... first one well, The first one was horrible. The and first... I bought a joystick just, just to play the first one. The first level of the first Rebel Assault is almost impossible. And so it's not a great yeah. introduction to a game where like the first level is almost impossible to get through. <laughs> they definitely had an Although... easier on-ramp for Rebel Assault 2. Although in those times it was pretty popular, for example, um, Lion King, which was released in 1994, is notorious for having very difficult first couple of levels. And they did that so that people who rented the game would not finish it in one weekend and then <laughs> they'd have to buy it. So maybe LucasArts had the same idea, but I think it was just bad game design. Yeah. <laughs> or limitations of the, the FMV videos because... It's a rail shooter, after all. You don't actually control anything. The movement is done automatically in terms of you moving in space. But the shooting is the only thing you control. And in that particular canyon, in the first level of Rebel Assault, then you're actually flying through a running movie. Yep. And hopefully you won't hit any of the huge hit boxes <laughs> <laughs> they added. <clears throat> Okay, this was fun. This is also the first nope. DOS game to support from LucasArts to support Visa mode. So as you can see, it was running in 640 by 480. The graphics were 320 by 240 underneath, but they were drawing all the text and the, the everything else was drawn in higher resolution on top of it. Okay, next up, we have a passport to adventure. Ha. Everybody said, do you support this? And then every time I said no, they said, well, it's not a big deal. And I thought, no, it is a big deal because it's like one of the, it's one of the more unique items in the, in the demo. You know, most of the games had demos. 
So to those who don't know, the Passport to Adventure was basically... How, how was it distributed? On floppy disks? Yeah, I think it magazines? put on one floppy. So they could put on, show it on a magazine or easily just throw it anywhere. So back in the day, um, Monkey Island 1 wasn't, um, wasn't released in Israel. So they imported it from the US and it was super expensive. The Monkey Island 1 cost like... I think one hundred and fifty dollars back wow. in nineteen ninety over here. So I didn't buy that back then. So my first introduction to Monkey Island was through this floppy disk with the demos. Hmm. And um, I'm trying to get Tammy Borowick for a conversation because she worked on this demo. Oh yeah. And as a kid, what freaked me out about this demo is when you walk over here. Oh yeah, the troll. The, the the troll appears out of nowhere, and it's waving its hands. <laughs> <laughs> so I heard an interview with Tammy in which she said that they gave her a copy of Monkey Island One, and she had to work with what she had. She couldn't create any new graphic assets, so she just had to block various locations. So instead of having the rest of the pier, she placed. Uh, this booth over here with the troll that appears out of nowhere. And she uh, said that she had to wave its arms because she didn't have any other animation. <laughs> and another thing is that all of the locations are kind of different. So for example, you don't have the kitchen over here. Mm -hmm. You don't have the, the pirate leaders. You have the kitchen directly over here. And and the uh, high street is also blocked in a way that instead of having the high street continue and you have to see the, the shop and everything, I think you enter the jail directly, right? No. Okay. Shady looking fellow. I think he's selling the uh, computer magazine. There were several versions of the, the demo. Uh -huh. And one of them came with a magazine in which this person is selling this magazine. <laughs> and I can't even skip any of the text. Okay. Let's switch to another demo which we have Loom over here. And in this version of uh, the Loom demo, you see a Lucasfilm Games logo that you don't see anywhere else, which is Wait, I think I skipped it. Maybe I skipped <laughs> it. Too impatient. No, that's weird. Oh, okay. I have another version. Wait. So I think that in Passport for Adventure, you since you see the Lucasfilm Games logo at the beginning before the menu, they uh -huh. don't display it in the demos themselves. But I have this Loom EGA demo mm -hmm. in which you see there this you logo. Very briefly. <laughs> it's the January CES preview, so it's a different demo. Yeah, there are quite a few demos of all the games too, and I try to support all those as well because a lot of them do have interesting little things like that where they were done before the game was released, and so you see something different than you did before. Or... And unlike the demo in Passport for Adventure, um, this one is unplayable. So it's just a loop. Mm. Okay, next up, we have the final game, which is, do you know which which game we're going to play? I have a suspicion. It's called Afterlife, <laughs> a game neither of us has played. Yes. I played it a, a bit more back in the day when I was working on the Mac version, because this did actually formally release for the Mac. Wait, I installed the DOS version. You should install, install the DOS. Stay, stay with the DOS version. The Windows version doesn't work. Oh. 
the um, oh. that uses more of Windows than I had support for in 2.0. That should be fixed in the next version. So. And you might think that's a bug, but it's not. I've had several people tell me that I ran it, and it showed me four versions of the logo, and it looked like it was done, but that's what they do. The game supported up to 1024 by 768 resolution, and so um, when you do that, it gets three by three grid of logos. So they just kind of were filling it up with however much. It's funny you should say that because when I started started testing this version and I wanted to test this, if my version of Afterlife is working, then I saw the four logos. And since I never played this game, I also thought it was a bug, <laughs> given that we're used to the fact that this is how a bug looks like. This is how they looked like back in the 90s when you had a um, graphic adapter issues. So I had to go to YouTube to see a playthrough to see if this is actually how the logos look like in the game. Playthroughs on YouTube have been very helpful for me in several spots to figure out where things is like, is that really the way it was? And sometimes yes, sometimes no. So. so, you know, a lot of the times in Scum VM, for example, they since they reverse engineer a lot of the, the engines in order to recreate the gaming experience you had, they try to recreate either from memory or from playthrough videos to see the timing of something if mm -hmm. they can't recreate or run the, the engine properly. Yeah. So simple for them. What's the point of this game? <laughs> so this was done back in the was like SimCity 2000 era. Maybe, I don't know if there was anything after that yet in the SimCity era, but the idea was basically sort of a, a SimCity where you control heaven and hell, and they have a bit of a symbiotic relationship between them. There's a lot of tongue-in-cheek humor. Uh, you know, it's done by the by the guys who did Sam and Max at the road, uh, Mike Stemley and uh, Sean Clark. So um, this was sort of their follow-on game to Sam, Sam and Max and... Uh, it's very interesting to me in a lot of ways. Um, I never really spent a lot of time to figure out strategies for it, but you know, there are strategy guides out there. There's a lot of tutorials in the game with animated characters that will guide you through it all. Um, it it plays kind of slow uh, in terms of you know it's a, it's a learning curve, and I think you know if you're the sort of person who wants to pick up a game and just start playing, it's not it's not that kind of game. It's the sort of game where you gotta spend some time with the manual or with the tutorials and go through and understand what the heck you're doing. I mean, you can actually, they developed a whole GUI. I mean, this they, this is a full GUI system. You can click on that whole bar on the left and drag it around the screen. You just got a whole menu systems and yeah, you can minimize yeah, scroll things. Up scroll down. Scroll up, scroll down. Or I heaven mean, and hell. It's because it was running on DOS. They didn't have any support. So um, I actually do plan to get the Windows version up and running. It just required a lot more Windows support than I wanted to put into the 2.0 version, but I've been doing a lot of Windows work recently uh, for a future version to get some more games going. And uh, so I, I think it should be doable in the future. Cool. Anything else you want to show in Dream or can I move to a few questions I have about <laughs> future versions? Uh, you can click on Dream options real quick. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, one of the things that uh, you can do is you can say manage install folder and change where you, where your games are installed. So a few people have requested. Normally it it gets put in your roaming app data folder, which is on your C drive. But if your C drive is short in space, uh, you can drag a new folder on this screen to change it, and then you can move your games there, and so that you don't have to do it uh, all on all on your C drive. So I wanted to make sure people knew about that. And then if you cancel a lot of that, um, the other thing I wanted to show you is if you click on Dream Options and then click About Dream. Um, in the middle, you'll see it says no sound fonts installed and, and, and MT32 emulation disabled. So um, in order to support Roland MT32 emulation in some of the games that do support it, you need a couple of ROM files, which I can't include because they're not licensed to me. But if you uh, get your hands on them, you can install them just by dragging and dropping them onto the Dream screen, and it'll install them in the right spot. And then the About screen will tell you whether you've whether it's got everything it needs to run the emulation. Uh, so that's kind of a useful thing. And if you can also do MIDI playback, if any game supports general MIDI or MT32, you can install sound fonts to customize the way it plays back. And there are some pretty good ones out there that sound pretty good with the games. And so uh, if you have a sound font, you can also drag and drop that onto Dream and it'll tell you, and it'll give you that as an option for you when you're configuring your sounds. Cool. So just want people to know about that. 
Maybe those just those options were there in 1.0, but they uh, weren't quite as uh, easy to figure out um, whether you had everything installed right. It just wouldn't work magically. So I wanted to improve that for sure. Cool. Now, I've been following you on Mastodon, and I've noticed that you finally got to cross something that's been on your bucket list for, for decades, and that's Yola Stories, a game that you didn't port in the 90s, but actually got it working in Dream. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there were two games in the series. There was Indiana Jones and his desktop adventures, uh, and then there was Yoda Stories, which was sort of a reskinning. I think they added a few more features, but it's basically a rough reskinning of it, and they're both... The idea is there are games that you pick up, you play, they're quick games, supposedly quick games that you can bust through in a half hour, an hour. They're randomly generated, so I wouldn't call them roguelikes, but they could be, they have that roguelike characteristic and that the randomly generated uh, quests that you're put on. So in Yoda Stories, you're, you're Luke, and Yoda gives you a quest, and you have to do some quests, so the quest is random each time, and the arrangement of rooms and, and, and uh, planets is random, and uh, the objects are random. Um, and so uh, you're basically just asked to uh, create these, um, solve these adventures. And I f thought it was a fun game, but the problem was it was written for the Windows GUI specifically. It used uh, the standard Microsoft class libraries uh, at the time, MFC. Uh, and so when I was on the Mac back in the day, they released the Indiana Jones game first. And uh, I liked the idea of the game. And in fact, Max. Uh, since the early System 6 days had things called desk accessories, which were, they weren't full applications. They were uh, specially crafted applications that were designed to run as like sort of diversions or little you know, useful things. So for example, the Mac shipped with like a puzzle disk accessory, which was like one of those sliding puzzles. Eventually they added a jigsaw puzzle, which was kind of a similar kind of thing. Um, and so I always felt like the, these games kind of felt like they were in that category of like things. So it felt kind of natural for something like that to be on the Mac. And so uh, I, I took the time to hack the, the heck out of the game in order to make it run on the Mac because there was no portability layer. It wasn't designed to be ported to different operating systems. It was really hard-coded to Windows from the beginning. And so I said, well, I can't really fix the problem that it's hard-coded to Windows. I'm just going to hack and hack and hack until I get it going. And I spent a lot of time getting Indiana Jones and his desktop adventures to, to run on the Mac. And they eventually did release it, which is good. But then they did Yoda Stories, and they made enough changes to the engine that I was forced to pretty much have to redo all my work. And at that time, they were like, we want you to work on Windows games. We don't want you to waste your time doing Mac games anymore because they just weren't selling to the, like, to the desire of the people in charge. And so I never got to do Yoda Stories. So um, fast forward, I've uh, started working on, as I mentioned, I started working on some new Windows games to run in version 2.1 whatever one or whatever. And um, I started with uh, Outlaws because I knew a lot about that, having worked on that from back in the day. Uh, and so, but what I quickly found is that even though Outlaws mostly just runs kind of like Curse of Monkey Island, where they go full screen and they just draw the graphics directly to configure your controls or to do certain other operations, they switch out of that and present a standard Windows GUI. Um, and uh, that was a lot of work to get that working. And I thought, am I really going to do this? And then in the past, every time I've ever done that in the past with Dream, I've said, I've eventually decided, yeah, sure, I'll give it a try. And I push through it and, and eventually get it, get it to go. So um, I have pushed through enough on that to get it going. But once I got enough of that going, I thought, well, I probably have enough going to start taking a whack at Indiana Jones and his desktop adventures and Yoda stories. So I started with Indiana Jones. And I thought, okay, this, this will be a good test. But then I looked at it, and it's a 16-bit Windows application. So 16-bit um, Windows applications are a very special thing that I may eventually support, because I eventually support everything, apparently. But um, for now, I put it to the side. And I said, well, maybe Yoda Stories, maybe they, they went to a proper 32-bit Windows application for Yoda Stories. And it turns out they did. So Yoda Stories has become my, my test bed for all the Windows GUI work, because it's a game that starts right, on, right in the Windows GUI. Everything's drawn with the Windows GUI. Uh, uses the windows and menus and and uh, dialog boxes and all kinds of normal stuff. And so uh, it's interesting that that all this time you thought it was just a reskinning of uh, Indiana Jones and and his desktop adventures. And in the end, even though they were released a, a year apart, they're vastly different in architecture. Yeah, well, I think it's mostly that they just recompiled it for 32-bit Windows. I think when they, I think it was they probably had to make some changes, but I think a lot of the code 
just worked either way. And it was sort of like a compile time decision. Do I compile it to be a 16-bit Windows app so that it'll run on Windows 3.1 and you know, with WinG or whatever else they were running at the time? Or do I commit and say it had to run on Windows 95 or later? Uh, so I think for the first game, they hedged their bets and said, well, we'll compile it in the most conservative way as a 16-bit app and hope that it works. Um, but uh, for Yoda Stories, I'm sure they saw the writing on the wall or got feedback from customers saying that we don't really care to run it on Windows 3.1. And so therefore, we uh, we can make it run as a full DOS program well, in, or full um, Windows program. And what, when Indiana Jones and this desktop adventure came out in 1996, probably people still didn't use Windows 95, while Yoda Stories, which came out in 1997, more people were using Windows 95, and it was pretty common to have a Windows 95 only game yeah. at that time. I mean, it seems inevitable to us now, you know, Microsoft's dominance, but when Windows 95 came out, there was a lot of question marks about it, especially in the gaming industry, because DOS was the thing. And we'd worked with DOS for many years. We knew how it worked. We knew we were hitting the limitations of it. We knew Windows was coming up and people wanted to run games on it. And Microsoft was doing a good job of pushing DirectX and creating a whole environment for it. So that was all coming along, but we weren't sure whether that was going to stick, you know. And as we, so I think a lot of the early releases on, on Windows and LucasArts were very much hedging. We we're, were just unsure. So, you know, we released simultaneous Rebel Assault 2 had a Windows front end that kind of wrapped the DOS version. Uh, and then, you know, Afterlife had DOS and Windows versions on the same CD. The Dig eventually had a Windows 95 native version on the same CD as the DOS version, because uh, clearly we were at a transition point there. We weren't sure, um, you know. And then they started releasing Windows-only games, but they were still not sure that 95 was sufficiently big in the market to uh, to warrant, you know, dropping support for Windows 3.1. So, you know, I think all these things were just a gradual move forward. And then, you know, you, you get games like Curse of Monkey Island and Outlaws, where you get the first real games that were like 32-bit Windows 95 plus only games. And, and I saw that you're also working on Mortimer and the Riddles of the Medallion. Yeah, so that's kind of interesting. You know, there's a lot of sites that that collect old software and, and disk images and stuff, and I'm having a hard time finding Mortimer on there. So I, I broke out my copy, my original copy of Mortimer to uh, make my own disk images for because it's obviously easier to find it online if you can. And... Uh, broke up my original versions to do it. But I mean, it's basically Rebel Assault 2 engine, uh, but it's Windows 95 only. Um, but as that turns out, that also game became one of those games where I'm like, oh, this should be easy to be up and running because it's just, you know, insane running on Windows 95. I've done that before. Chris and Mike Allen does that. Grim Fandango does that. Outlaws does that. They'll work fine. But then I didn't realize that they had a full launcher and the launcher is all the configuration for how to run the game. Like you have to configure which character you're playing and the, everything. And it wasn't as minimal of a launcher as I thought there's like, and it uses fancy dialogue boxes and property sheets and all kinds of stuff that I had no idea I would end up supporting, <laughs> but, uh, but can't you, can't you use some default settings just to make it run? So I was able to hack. So there's a, there is a, it does, cause it does eventually launch another process. So that was the other thing is I thought the launcher contained the game as well. So you couldn't bypass the launcher. Cause that's what happens like with the dig and the windows 95 version of the dig, um, comes up with a launcher normally, but I figured out a special command line, that you could slip in there that it would make it bypass the launcher and go right into the game so I didn't have to worry about supporting all the Windows user interface that involves with the launcher. Uh, for Mortimer, what they do is they want to run the launcher and then it launches another program and then waits for that to, to quit. And then when that program's done, it launches the launcher back again. And um, so I could launch that, but it was pretty minimal what you could do with it. And so I was able to sort of get it to run um, by running the program directly, but decided that with all the work I'd done on Yoda stories, I'd kind of gotten it halfway there. And so maybe I could just get it the rest of the way there to get it to run. So at this point, I've got it. So you can pretty much navigate all the user interface in Mortimer and get it to run. Um, the main trick right now is that uh, my Windows emulation was only designed to run one process at a time. Um, and here you've got two, the launcher and the other one running at the same time. So it sort of caused me to do some deferred maintenance on the on the engine in order to uh, support. Wait, but, like but uh, the process for the launcher is working at all times with the process of the game. So for a little while they coexist, um, 
and then they then they'll launch probably on startup out. probably on startup yeah yeah but there's other reasons so the, the thing is all these things you might think well this is kind of a lot of work for one game but every time i look at that i think but there's other things i can do with that work beyond this one game that sit in the back of my mind and so Every bit of work that I do that I put into making this Windows emulation more complete, where I can support multiple processes and three direct 3D and the Windows GUI, like I have a ton of ideas for other things I'd like to do with the same engine. And by building this out now, I have an, an excuse to get a game running, which is great. And it's an incentive to drive me forward. But then I also have um, a lot of tools in my toolbox to employ in new ways uh, in the future, which I plan to do. So. Well, I figured that it's you've done it for those reasons and not for your affinity for Rebel Assault for Kids, which is basically <laughs> what Mortimer is. Yeah, it's got its charms and it does run. It's actually high resolution movies. They're the first game we shipped that actually has 640 by 480 movies uh, running because it was shipped before Outlaws did. And Outlaws has uh, high resolution movies as well. Uh, and, and Curse of Monkey Island does as well. Okay, I'll now mention a few games that you're currently working on. Which other games do you plan to add in the future? So I have two. Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones. <laughs> I have two Jones. two ideas for directions to go. One is more the Windows route, the early Windows games, because I know those are hard to get running on modern systems. And so, uh, you know, Jedi Knight is an obvious candidate because that was sort of the next in line there. I have to take a look at Infernal Machine. I don't know if that's uh, how doable that is. Um, Shadows of the Empire might be doable. Uh, that was early 3D. It's probably low-level enough 3D that it wouldn't be too bad to run with my my emulation layer. Um, but I also have an interest in some of the older games that don't see a lot of love um, from you know uh, from other emulators like uh, like the early flight sim games, the pre X-wing games like uh, Secret Weapons of the Luftwaffe and, and Battle of Britain and those guys, uh, which are kind of classics in what their own right. What about Pipe Dream? Pipe Dream could could be. It's on my list of things to look at. Um, I remember uh, there was a Mac version of Pipe Dream that I remember playing as well. So there's that. Uh, I was kind of hoping there were a few games that I, I had hoped existed on the PC that never shipped for the PC. So I'm like, okay, well, you know, it'll never be a Labyrinth because I don't think that ever shipped for DOS. So I don't think we'll ever see that on a, in in Dream. Uh, I don't think I plan to expand to support, you know, Commodore 64 or Apple II or Atari or whatever <laughs> platforms that shipped on. And basically, what's your cutoff year? So, for example, um, anything that works on current modern systems will not be added to Dream? Yeah, I, I think until it becomes impractical is really my cutoff year. So once we get games that are taking too much advantage of the hard, hardware acceleration uh, to be able to run at speed at that point, I'll be like, okay, well, maybe that's, that, that, that's the cutoff. So I suspect, you know, early 2000s will be the latest before it, it really starts to become uninteresting from uh, my perspective because I'm still an old school guy. Oh, plus in, there's, in the app. No, go ahead. I was going to say this. Plus there's non LucasArts ideas that I have. So, you know, obviously LucasArts is my focus right now. That's what dream is. And then, I have other ideas for things that would be interesting to see running again that also kind of live in that time period. So if you have suggestions, you know, let me know your favorite game that uh, you can't get Bantus running anymore. Too. <laughs> you can't get running on modern systems anymore, <laughs> especially early Windows stuff. That probably be pretty uh, pretty straightforward to get a lot of that stuff. Uh, I'll, I'll think about it. All of the games from the dark ages of ninety seven until two thousand five, in which every game developer used whichever method he want he or she wanted to create a game some used direct x some used some proprietary um system that they had for example even the fmv games were we're currently playing x files on mm -hmm. stream and it's an fmv game from 1998 there's nothing special about it but the problem is that you can't even run it on windows 98 that well because it uses QuickTime and a version of QuickTime that's been deprecated like decades ago and basically I had to create I had to install Windows 95 on a DOS box image in order to get the X-Files game running <laughs> so I'm using an emulation inside an emulation to play a game because 
there is no possible way to run it on modern system. Yeah. No, it reminds me like even games like Yoda Stories wouldn't run on. I was running Windows 2000 in a in a VM to run some of these early games and trying to run Yoda Stories on it, it would it would crash immediately on startup. And it turns out that uh, one of the things they were calling had the parameters reversed. Uh, they were passing a pointer and a length, and they were passing it as the length and the pointer, and uh, that was causing it to crash on Windows 2000. I have no idea how it ran on Windows 95 or 98, unless they had a special hack to catch that particular situation. But uh, I was able to get it to run by hacking the DLL that was doing it and switching the parameters around in the in the code so that I could actually run it because I needed a, a reference to see how it's supposed to run. Now, have GOG or Steam approached you? regarding adding dream to their game bundles no I, I don't know how that would how that works I suspect I don't know how much they do of that work versus how much is done by the publisher so you know I, the gog and steam bundles seem to be pretty similar um, so I wonder if it's the same people who did them both or not no usually usually gog updates their um, bundles more often. Oh, yeah. So, for example, there there are games on GOG that have Scum VM, while their Steam equivalent uh, uses DOSBox, like Phantasm Gore 2, for example. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think it's more of a promotion issue. We need to promote the dream better, and this is what this video is for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, certainly it's something but, that awareness is, awareness is good. And, and I, I've always thought that it would be nice to have Dream is an option for running some of these games, you know, with that. It'd be great, it'd be great to partner with with one of them to do it uh, if there was interest in it or if there were, you know, games that were hard to configure or get running in some of those other systems. It might be kind of fun to uh, to try and get them running smoothly on Dream because it's one of the things I feel like I'm working. A lot of the work is the emulation, but a lot of the work is also just kind of adding the polish on the front end to make it streamlined and easy to configure, to set up, to run. Um, and uh, so there's a surprising amount of work that goes into that. And so I'm willing to put in that work on you know games to make that an easy experience for people, especially for games that are particularly challenging to, to get running. So f- for example, games that already have Scum VM support, maybe it's uh, harder to convince them to switch to, to Dream if they um, run the same way or, mm-hmm. or in a way that's not very noticeable to regular players. But games like Escape from Monkey Island, when the the current user experience is really bad, you you run, you install Escape from Monkey Island from GOG, and first of all, the compatibility settings cause your screen resolution to change to 640 by 480, yeah. which is great. I have a 4K screen and I'm watching a 640 by 480 um, resolution. And the second thing is because because of these uh, compatibility settings, it asks you for admin permissions to run the game. Right. And it's always dodgy when something asks you for admin permissions to run Escape from Monkey Island, of exactly. all things. No, I agree. I, I agree that, that, that those are areas where I think it would be good to have an option to, to run Dream. So yeah, hey, if you're listening. I'm happy to work yeah. with the, to make it easy. I have, I've have several ideas. You know, the first version of Dream was designed so you could put it right next to the files uh, of a game and just double click it, and it would notice that it was next to the files of a game and just kind of pick that up and run, so that you could kind of easily bundle it. Uh, I step, took a step away back from that in 2.0, and that you have to install the games. But um, I've been thinking back about how to make sort of reestablish that to make it easier uh, to bundle it potentially, uh, so that there's not work that has to be done on the effort, you know, like if, if somebody wanted to bundle it, that they could just take it as is without having to make a special version or any special configurations to get it to run. So, so is there any command line support for that? For example, if they create a bash file with command line commands, yeah, does it work? Not, not really. Um, I have, I have some, uh, so internally I actually have, uh, uh, some description files that describe each game. There are text files and they're kind of parsed out at the beginning. And so um, through certain configurations there, you can kind of uh, make it go um, to, to run a specific game or, or whatever you want that way. So that's sort of the direction I've been moving is to have these configuration files that are currently you know shipped with the game. And by default, the configuration says, you know, don't, don't run any particular game. Um, but uh, you could configure it to say, you know, run this one on launch or something like that. 
Now, before we conclude this conversation, I want to read the comment that your father wrote on our previous conversation. <laughs> he wrote, Thanks, Daniel, for the excellent interview of my son. I was surprised, however, that no mention was made of the legal fiasco that ensued when Aaron pitched the idea of creating a PlayStation emulator for the Mac to his then-employer, Connectix. So, I'm going to rectify this by asking you... What was the legal fiasco that ensued when you pitched the idea of creating a PlayStation emulator for the Mac to your then employer, Connectix? Uh, there's many videos on the subject, so I won't uh, go into all the details. But the, sh the short answer is that basically, when I worked at Connectix, we, I and another developer there over six months developed an emulation for the first Sony PlayStation that was optimized to run on the first generation of iMacs. So these, these are the bubble uh, neon colored iMacs. And uh, we got it to run. We got a, a keynote at, at Macworld by Steve Jobs, actually introduced the product and said, you know, you can actually run PlayStation games uh, on your Mac. And it was a, it was a big hit. And, and then we got sued by Sony, um, which we weren't, we were anticipating. They were, they made it pretty clear that they were going to sue us, but we decided to ship it anyway. It was a, that was a, an interesting decision by our CEO, but uh, turned out that, uh, you know, we, we did lots of depositions and, almost went to trial and then we settled out of court. Um, but the, the, they created several preliminary injunctions against the product to prevent it from being sold. And those were uh, one on appeal um, eventually in ways that set good precedents for emulation as a viable thing. And so um, even though the product itself was sort of a flash in the pan because it got shut down pretty quickly by Sony, um, the legacy of the product is probably its most important thing, which is that it established a legal basis for a lot of emulation in the in the court of law, which was good. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that's that's in the end is probably its better legacy. But uh, if you go to uh, if you go to my, um, I have a playlist of videos that a few people uh, on the on YouTube have made about the whole legal fiasco, what the product was, who was involved, and, and I gave interviews with them. And if you want to. If you want to see those uh, uh, and learn more about that, I encourage you to visit my, uh, I, I can send you a pointer to the playlist, Daniel. So if you want to put that up uh, of, of the other videos and people can get all the details they want about it. Will do. My dad will be very happy. Well, about it. <laughs> yeah. Now let's see what your father writes in the comments of this video. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel, but you forgot time. to mention. <laughs> Well, thank you, Aaron, for taking the time to join me in this conversation. It's been real fun chatting with you again. Yeah, thank you for uh, having me on and, and walking through Dream and giving me a chance to sort of explain sort of the thought process and show some kind of fun little esoteric bits about some of the games that I learned along the way. And you guys should go and download Dream today. <laughs> Bye.